Zigni, Paul Wiedefeld. Uh, oh, Josh is here. Well, we have you as well. So we have many secretary design designates uh, uh, before us. So Josh, why don't you come up here and kick it off and let me begin by uh, congratulating you once again on your uh, appointment by the governor as the next secretary of the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, let me turn your microphones on there. The one rule we have in the ENT committee, don't touch the buttons. <laughs> so um, take it away, Josh. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, Madam Speaker. A pleasure to have you here today, uh, members of the committee. Um, really excited to be here. Um, plan to spend a lot of time with you all. Uh, just before we get into the, the content here, if at any point anything that you know I can do or my staff can do um, for you all, please feel free to reach out. Um, my cell phone is always on, and I always take texts, you know, emails, all that. So I um, just wanted to start there. Again, thank you for having us. Today we're going to talk about something really critical for the Bay and something really critical for our economy, and that's the oyster population and what's going on with oysters. Um, I think as many of you know, uh, oysters are incredibly important, right? They're, they're filter feeders, uh, they're delicious, and people love them, um, and they are the backbone of an economy on the eastern shore. So these are really critical pieces for us and something that we're working to restore really hard um, and have had kind of a tough go. We're going to get into a little bit of that. Uh, but basically today I'm going to give you very, very high level comments and then turn it over to uh, my two scientists and leaders here um, in Chris Judy and Jody Baxter who lead our shellfish program. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we're going to do. Thank you. All right, so the next slide you're going to see when it comes up is going to kind of outline uh, the, the talk as we're going to have it. Um, we're going to focus on kind of how we, man how we manage what we're looking at when we think about oysters, um, kind of the status of where we are with the resource, and then looking forward. So I think this is the part we're really excited about, uh, the, the things that we're seeing that we can do to really continue to increase abundance for this critical species. All right, so next is going to be the status. Um, this is a really important graph here. Um, because it really shows you kind of where we are. And, and what I want to really orient you to is that middle point where it says long-term period of stability and then that decrease. Um, we saw MSX and Dermo, which are oyster diseases that came into the bay and really wiped out the population, brought it way, way down. Um, and so what we've been really focusing on is kind of recovering from that. Uh, as you can see, you know, very, very long time ago, huge, huge amounts of harvest, but that relative period of stability and that big drop off is key for everybody to keep in mind, and that we're really trying to bring the population back from where it was. On top of disease, we have a couple other challenges. Uh, the water in the bay has become exceedingly more fresh over time, and oysters really need higher salinity to reproduce successfully. So when we look at kind of how the restoration is going, you're going to see areas geographically where it's doing better. A lot of those are because of higher amounts of salinity and, and better water quality. Um, so that's something that we keep in mind as we're thinking about restoration um, and something that's really important for all of us. You know, geographically, this does look different across the bay. So when we think about management, we're thinking about three things. Sanctuaries, that's areas where we're protecting oysters so that they can reproduce. Oysters reproduce by shooting spat up into the water column then sloshes around throughout the bay, grabs onto something hard, and turns into oysters. So those sanctuaries are areas where we're restoring them so that we can have that seed production, basically, um, where we can, can really uh, foster that, that, um, that restoration through the reproduction, as well as improve water quality in those areas. The next is the public fishery area, obviously, a major eco economic driver for our, our, our watermen. And that's ways we're managing that to make sure that we're increasing abundance so that that is, continues to be a robust economy, is going to continue to grow, and is also done in a way that's sustainable um, for long-term growth. And the third is aquaculture. When you think about aquaculture, what is that? It's basically farming of oysters. And there's a couple of different ways that we're doing that and seeing that be done across the bay. And so that's really, if you think about oyster management as a three-legged stool, those are the three legs of the stools, and that's kind of what we're trying to approach and tackle when we think about our programming here at the Department of Natural Resources. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the experts. Well, that was... Thank you. It was great to be here. I appreciate the invitation, and I think it's been two or three years, maybe more. I see a lot of familiar faces, and I remember this committee as being one of the more pleasurable committees, if I might extend a compliment. Well, thank you. <laughs> and you, you are brilliant, of course. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would get the humor of that. So before we move to the next slide, you can see this one is about oyster management, and uh, Secretary Kurtz did a great job uh, with the introduction. 
But before we move on with oyster management and the three different sectors, maybe we'll take a segue to oyster biology. And there might be a quiz at the end, so please take notes. Uh, if you don't know, uh, and I'll be brief because a lot of you do know this, oysters are bivalves. They live on the bottom of the bay. A bivalve is a creature with two shells. The two shells are shucked. You have an oyster to eat. Uh, if you obviously leave the oyster on the bottom, it exists as an organism as part of the bay. So oysters are bivalves. They live on the bottom, and they don't move. Fish and crabs will swim around and crawl, etc. Oysters stay put. They're sessile. They're benthic. They live on the, the bottom of the bay. When they spawn, they spawn in the summer. And as mentioned, uh, they, they cast their, their larvae into the water. The larvae move, they become spat, and they settle to the bottom. Uh, and that's important, and it's also it's an important thing to grasp as decision makers, uh, as you are. Uh, the larvae are in the water, they're moving around, and when it's time after about two weeks to settle to the bottom and attach to something, the something they attach to needs to be clean and firm. They don't attach to mud, they don't attach to sand. They need something firm, and typically, you know, throughout history, it's been another oyster shell or a live oyster. So when you think about oysters, Reproduction is important, larvae in the water is important, the spat set that happens is crucial because that's the future generation of oysters. Uh, and the spat set depends upon good, clean, hard bottom habitat. So those are just some basics. Uh, and I'll close with this comment. Spat set drives the population. So when you think of you know, what we might do to help oysters, you know, we're helping, we're assisting. In nature, spat set is the driver of the population. So we're going to start with one of those three vital sectors, uh, the public fishery. And when you hear about the public fishery, you might think of oystermen. There also are, though, oyster women. I know a man and a wife who oyster together, and different women oyster on their own. So I'm just going to use the word harvesters, oyster harvesters. You have oyster harvesters that work in the fishery. They sell to a processor or a shipper. Oysters make their way into, uh, say, a local restaurant or your kitchen. So this is basically the public oyster fishery. It occurs on state bottoms, state bottoms. And one important concept of management, uh, you can read the slides and I'll highlight a few things in a minute. The purpose of oyster management with our regulations, laws, et cetera, as you see listed there, is to protect the population and protect the brood stock. As you have brood stock protected, these are the adults, they can spawn and produce the spat as the two of us have just described. So management is really focused a lot on the habitat and the population for the continuation of the oyster. So how do we do this? Uh, we have an oyster season. You can catch oysters through the winter months, but not in the summer. There's days of the week that you can catch oysters, not on Saturdays and Sundays. There are bushel limits. It might be 10 bushels per boat or per man, per person. 10 bushels per person might be 12. Uh, those are most of the, uh, the harvesters' limits, 10 or 12. Uh, we have opened and closed areas. What that means is, well, for example, sanctuaries you just heard about, they're closed. But we also have harvest areas that are closed perhaps for a year or two. Then they open, but they close again, and then stocks rebuild. So we have open and closed areas within the fishery itself. And we have limits that are set, or these limits, these limits are set annually by the department uh, based on data that we have from our extensive surveys and also our stock assessment. Uh, in terms of harvesters, between 800 to 1,300 harvesters work in the fishery each season, depending on if it's a good season or a poor season. And an important concept here, the word surcharge. So I'll take a moment to explain that. That's the last bullet. An oysterman has to buy a surcharge to actually go oyster. So let's suppose uh, the harvester has what's called a tidal fish license. They can fish, crab, et cetera, catch eels, whatever. That's the tidal fish all-encompassing license. And they can oyster. But they can't oyster until first they buy the surcharge. So no one can enter the oyster fishery as an active harvester, a licensed harvester, until they get the surcharge. So that's what that bottom bullet is referring to. Even though there's 2,800 some commercial licenses in Maryland uh, that could harvest oysters, what we see in reality 
is 800 to 1300 people actually getting that oyster surcharge. Next, please. This map shows activity within the public fishery. By that I mean places where the harvesters plant either shells or oyster seed to help the fishery itself. Uh, we work with the oyster industry through things called the oyster committees. Uh, each county along the tidewater has an oyster committee of harvest, and we work with these committees annually. The committees make decisions with us about where to plant either shells or seed, seed or small oysters, and then the small oysters will grow. So the map represents basically an investment the industry is making in its own future. Uh, you can see the orange areas are areas where these investments are made. And in terms of some numbers, the public fishery comprises about 76% of the historic oyster bars in Maryland. And in terms of activities, uh, we have shell plantings that occur, greater than 1.5 million bushels over this uh, period from 2010, 160,000 bushels of what's called natural seed. Natural seed are spat that nature produced that get moved into these areas. And then 2.3 billion hatchery spat. Hatchery spat are the young oysters produced through hatchery technology. And in terms of funding, these investments, these plantings, are funded by a bushel tax, which is paid every time a bushel of oysters is sold across the dock or from a truck or whatever. There's a $1 per bushel tax. The oyster export tax is paid when oysters leave the state of Maryland to another state. That's 30 cents a bushel. The oyster surcharge revenue, every time a person pays their surcharge annually, that comes into this fund. And then there's a grant from the Maryland Department of Transportation. So Can I interrupt funds, you for a second? Uh, yes. What is the surcharge cost? It's 300, right? $300? $300. Okay, yeah. thank you. Right. So quick math, if there's 1,000 participants, each pay $300,000 $300, come into the fund. And it's, let's say there's a 400,000 bushel harvest, a $1 per bushel tax, $400,000 come into the fund, et cetera. And just as a side note, there has been discussion on the Senate side of possibly having a bill to raise the bushel tax and the export tax because the taxes have been in existence so long. Well, moving to the other sector in that uh, three-legged stool example, uh, and it's all about balance. The, the, a stool has three legs for obvious reasons. With two or one, it would fall over. So uh, part of this theme of balance among our management strategies, we have aquaculture. Aquaculture is the farming of oysters. The public fishery was about harvesting oysters from the state bottom. Aquaculture is about farming. And in order to farm oysters, you first have to get a piece of the bottom as basically your own. That's done by leasing bottom from the state. So let's say Delicate Jacobs wanted to be an oyster farmer, and I picked on him because we've known each other quite a while, and I don't think he would mind. Uh, if he wanted to get a lease, he would apply to the state. He would get a lease. Perhaps it's 10 acres or 15 acres. And now he can become an oyster farmer. We still own the bottom. It's still state bottom, but he's leasing it from us and he'll plant it. So in the aquaculture industry, uh, some facts and figures are here for your, your benefit. Uh, Farm-raised oyster harvest decreased because of a severe freshet we had, heavy, heavy freshwater flow from rain in 2018 and 19. And in 2020, the pandemic, of course, slowed the economy greatly. But since then, farm-raised oysters or aquaculture oysters have increased. And you can see the bar graph uh, to highlight a number if that's not clearly visible. On the, on the far right, uh, the harvest is approaching 92,000 bushels. So since uh, 2002, if I can read that correctly, 12, 2012, thank you, I have a small version of this. Uh, we have quite a significant increase in aquaculture production, and that's important. The value is $6.2 million for the farmed uh, aquaculture oysters. The public fishery didn't have that number on the previous slide, but the public fishery value is approximately 15 to over $20 million because of the, the larger quantity of oysters. Could you do the committee a favor? Yes. There are uh, three colors. Would you uh, read them out for us? Because it's, 
difficult for me to see it, and I think it's important to enter it into the record. Oh, very good. Uh, let's see. Uh, so we have blue. And Jody, I might need help with this because. It's not actually a lease. Pardon? Submerged land. Okay. Lease. Blue are, is the submerged land lease. I also have trouble seeing it on the screen. Oh, look at that. Uh, so the, the blue bars are the submerged land leases, uh, the acres. So it shows uh, the activity of leasing the bottom. And the green? Water column leases. Thank you. Surface Water column land. leases. And that's a good point. Thanks for bringing this up. You can lease the bottom, which is fairly typical, but you can also lease the water column. Uh, thank you for bringing up uh, the differences here. You can lease the water column, which does not include the bottom, and you can grow oysters suspended in trays and cages and, set, and et cetera. So the, the uh, green is the uh, water column activity, and then the red is the oyster harvest, total harvest, which is that uh, 92,000 bushel value on the far right. The third leg of the stool, the third priority in management, is sanctuary. These are closed areas. They're not to be harvested. We have 51 sanctuaries in Maryland since 2010. And in terms of bar acreage, 24% of the historic oyster bar acreage is in sanctuary status. We have two basic types of sanctuaries in Maryland. We have large-scale sanctuaries for large-scale restoration. There's five of those areas, and they're uh, indicated in purple on the map. So we have there Harris Creek, the Upper Tredevon, Little Chop Tank, Minokin, and the Upper St. Mary's. This is the commitment the state of Maryland, the department, everyone has made to restore on a large scale oysters in these five areas. We also have small scale restoration sanctuaries. For example, Severn River, Nanticoke River, South River, Magathy, and, and a few others. And the small scale sanctuaries aren't highlighted it's just a, a few of the orange areas fall into the small-scale category. And the difference here, a large-scale sanctuary will see in the neighborhood of a billion spat planted through the years of the projects being done, ballpark. Small-scale sanctuaries, not a billion spat, it's more on the order of plus or minus 70 million. So small-scale basically refers to both smaller acreage of activity in the tributary, but also far less spat being planted. But still, 70 million spat being planted in a tributary is a great step forward from having none. And I should, no, let me mention something before we move on. That's fine, you can stay there. In terms of sanctuaries and restoration, well, actually, I'll just do it right here. In terms of sanctuary and restoration, if you remember the public fishery comment, uh, natural spat set was key. Spat set drives the public fishery because it drives the natural population. In these five restoration sanctuaries, it's a little bit reversed. There are massive seed plantings of spat in these five tributaries. So the driver of the population increase in these five sanctuaries is actually spat planting. It's an opposite relationship than you saw in the public fishery. Nature will provide a natural spat set in some of these sanctuaries, these, these five, but the real driver of the increase is going to be the spat plantings that are made. So let, let me go through a couple more points before we uh, look at these individual areas. So one, spat set is the main driver in the fishery, and these five areas, plantings, are the main driver of progress. Uh, another big theme and these five tributaries, activities have been mandated. We've been uh, on the job getting it done. And the uh, large-scale restoration in these five sanctuaries is on track, on schedule, to meet the 20 by, or the 2025 commitment. So we're on schedule to meet the commitment to do these five tributaries. And another overall theme before I go down the list of uh, rivers, in terms of results, and this is in general terms. If you want another briefing, these five tributaries could be an hour unto itself. In general terms, abundant plantings of spat have yielded abundant populations of oysters. So as an analogy, you drive down the countryside, you see a cornfield. You don't really wonder how did the corn get there. It was put there. Well, in these sanctuaries, we have abundant populations of oysters because they were put there. It's really that simple. Uh, 
Uh, so, some uh, details. Harris Creek, the tributary is restored. It meets the goals that were set forward in this commitment to do five tributaries, and it's a restored tributary based on the acreages of plantings, the number of oysters that are living there now, so that's designated restored. The Little Chop Tank, initial restoration is complete, and I'll explain that in a minute. And second seedings are ongoing. So let's take a pause and look at those terms. When one of these five tributaries are addressed, there are initial plantings. That's the first dose of hatchery spat that are planted. And it might be hundreds of millions of spat are planted. Uh, it's usually around 5 million per acre, if you like numbers, 5 or 6 million per acre. So that's the initial planting. Then a three-year period passes, those oysters grow, and the population is monitored. If we haven't reached the designated targets for this program, we'll then, say, fill the gaps, so to speak. A second planting will occur, usually at a lower density because we're just filling in some gaps. And that second planting, or the second seeding, is what then attains, basically, the tributary reaching that restored status. So just to recap, initial restoration means the initial plantings, three years pass, they're monitored, we see where we stand, and if needed, and usually it is needed, a second seeding will occur to put the icing on the cake, so to speak, and complete the project. So Little Chop Tank has initial restoration complete, and second seedings are ongoing. Credivon, same situation. Initial restoration complete, second seedings are ongoing. Upper St. Mary's, ditto, initial complete, second seedings are ongoing. So these three projects are well underway, and the finishing touches are being added. And monitoring occurs, of course, to see that the second seeding got the job done. The Minokan River, uh, just began actually. So restoration began in 2021 and we're addressing habitat and seeding needs, etc. And we can have an update on that in the future. So that's pretty much, uh, I guess that's the summary. Uh, spat set uh, is not the driver in sanctuaries, seeding is. Uh, oh, well, one final comment. Uh, some people have asked this in, in our years of, of doing this work. So in terms of some basic numbers, I mentioned aggressive seed plantings are happening, uh, in case you're curious what that means. So I mentioned five to six million spat per acre. Well, let's bring that into a number that's maybe more understandable. Think of a square meter or a square yard. So one square yard or one square meter of area. How many spat are planted on that square meter? Uh, approximately 1,500 about 1,500 spat, and they're nearly microscopic in size, attached to shells. So in that square meter area, about 1,500 spat are planted. That's the commitment of that initial seeding. And then as they grow, they don't all live, that's normal. We end up with approximately, and this varies, 15 larger oysters, 15 oysters, or 50, and then sometimes even 100 plus. So many are planted per square meter, but then many die because uh, near, nearly microscopic oyster is vulnerable. But we yield these populations of 15 or 50 or even 100 per square meter. And to put this in perspective, a square meter with 15, 50, or 100 large oysters, that's a dense population of oysters. So that's how, uh, uh, those are some numbers to echo what I said initially, abundant, abundant seed plantings are yielding abundant population in these five areas. Looking forward, all right, that, that's pretty much what's been going on, and that's the status. So looking forward, uh, we have some updates on the Oyster Advisory Commission, an update on a, a recent bill, uh, update on the Bay Bottom Survey, uh, the Eastern Bay Project, and oysters as a best management practice. Uh, well, yes. No, is that the end of your presentation? No, uh, five more minutes, I think. Oh, all right, go all for right. it. Sorry. Yep. So the, the Oyster Advisory Commission. So uh, looking forward, updates on uh, things that are in the near future. We have an Oyster Advisory Commission. We've had one for numerous years. They worked very hard to produce a consensus report, which they did. 
and uh, they provided recommendations to DNR, recommendations to DNR. There are 26 voting members on the OAC, 60% represent industry, and 40% represent environmental groups and academia, uh, in a nutshell. So in 2021, the package of recommended uh, recommendations came to the department. Uh, it's to be incorporated in DNR's oyster management plan, and that is underway. Uh, we're mandated to uh, update, amend our oyster management plan with these 19 recommendations from the OAC. We're in the process of doing that. In terms of some recent legislation, in 2022, the General Assembly had Senate Bill 830 cross-filed with House Bill 1228, and it was written in response to this report of 19 recommendations. It said basically, let's flesh this out, let's get some things going, let's get some activity underway. It has seven main topics. Uh, you can see them here, in-state shucking houses, shell recycling, bay bottom survey, a study on different substrates, a report on substrate needs, increasing larval production through, as I mentioned earlier, hatchery technology, and the Eastern Bay Project. Uh, we have for you an update on the Bay Bottom Survey and the Eastern Bay Project. And, you know, at a later date, obviously, if you're interested in more topics, you can come back again. Let me interrupt you. Sure. Uh, um, go back one. Uh, explain to the newer members of my committee what a substrate is. Oh, very good. Sure. So remember the biology lesson, and I don't think there will be a quiz. Uh, the larvae are in the water for two weeks, approximately. They move to the bottom, and they have to attach. That hard, clean object or, or material, that's substrate. Substrate typically is oyster shell. That's what's in the natural environment. But we can use other materials as substrate. We can use clam shell. We can use recycled concrete of an, an appropriate size, like a golf ball size. We can use stone, natural stone of different sizes. So substrate is that hard material upon which an oyster larvae will attack. Sure. Bay bottom survey. This is very important. Jody and I have been beating the drum and pounding the table for 10 years plus. Uh, the bay bottom survey is important because it's, it provides us a map picture of what's on the bottom. So back to substrate. Some of the bottom is sand, some of the bottom is mud. Actually, most of the bay bottom is sand or mud. Some is the shelly, hard bottom habitat. And having up-to-date maps is important. The last time a bay bottom survey was done was uh, in the 1980s, back to the 70s into the 80s. And we call it the 1983 survey because that's when it was wrapped up. So the 1983 survey, it used sonar equipment. You know, electronic, modern sonar equipment, but modern as of the period of 1983. So today we have much more, uh, say, complicated, helpful, accurate sonar equipment, much improved. And from the 1980s, the bay bottom has changed. Obviously, you know, the bay is a changing environment. So we've lost some shell habitat. Things have moved around. So therefore, uh, a bay bottom survey, an up-to-date new survey, is crucial. And this was in the bill, so we're, we're happy to see this happening. Uh, let's see another couple of topics here. It will be used to identify current oyster habitat. It'll identify sand and mud, et cetera. But you know, of course, our focus, because we're making plantings of shell and seed, et cetera, we want to know where the oyster habitat is. These maps, not just providing us with information of where to put material, these maps also can be used to redelineate the oyster bar boundary. Now, you may not know this, and uh, maybe this is a bit of a history lesson. Uh, the state has official oyster bar charts or maps with legal oyster bar boundaries on them. Now, you own a house, you have a property, you have a plat. That's your legal boundary. Uh, there are zoning codes, commercial, agriculture, etc. A lot of legal boundaries that we're used to on land. We have oyster bar charts that show the legal boundaries of the oyster bars on the bay bottom. And they're quite old. Uh, we have two sets of charts, just to clarify a little information here. We have charts from the 1906-1912 survey. Those are historic oyster bar charts, and they have the legal boundaries of an oyster bar from that time period. The 1983 charts, which is how I opened up this slide, the 83 survey 
remapped the bottom in 1983, so we have the 83 legal boundaries of oyster bars, and it's high time, basically, to have a, a new survey and new charts that are more accurate. And I think that uh, wraps that up. Any questions on the Bay Bottom survey? Um, no. Okay, we, yeah. uh, well, um, unless somebody two, has a question. Okay. Two more, uh, two or three more slides. Oh, all right. Oh, you're not done yet. Okay. okay. I keep sorry. misinterpreting your... Uh... Eastern Bay Project. Well, let's, let's just... Uh, so we, there are three more slides. There we go. Eastern Bay Project. Next update. The Eastern Bay Project originated with DNR in around 2019. It was uh, presented to uh, leadership at DNR, which approved it. It then moved to the Oyster Advisory Commission, which I mentioned earlier we worked with. The Oyster Advisory Commission liked the, uh, the idea, and then it moved into the bill, and now there's a commitment to do the Eastern Bay Project. So let me uh, encapsulate what that means. If you think of sanctuary projects in the past, they were basically exclusionary. We have a sanctuary, we're going to do a project, no watermen are involved, you're not part of this project, it's a sanctuary, etc. And you can't lease on the bottom that's part of the sanctuary project, so aquaculture can't participate. So basically these past projects were one-dimensional, somewhat exclusionary. The Eastern Bay project has an entirely different concept. It says let's have a mixed-use project, let's be inclusive. Uh, let's have the different groups, back to the three-legged stool, let's have the different groups participate together. So let's have a project that tries to rebuild the oyster population, in this case in Eastern Bay, but bringing everyone together rather than potentially dividing and separating them apart. So that's the concept of the Eastern Bay Project, say, functionally, uh, let's work together. But biologically, and this isn't on the slide, biologically it has an important uh, foundation. Eastern Bay once had a great spat set. It was a productive area. Eastern Bay, and this is 30, 40, 50 years ago, Eastern Bay once had uh, regular spat sets, abundant populations, large levels of harvest. It was a rich area, a very functional area, which is what we hope all the areas of the Bay will, will get back to uh, through all of our programs. So Eastern Bay was sitting there as this, this once very productive, vibrant area, and when you wonder, well, what happened? One of the main things that happened in Eastern Bay over the decades, and of course there's been development and such and pressures, but one of the main things that happened to Eastern Bay was the disease epizootics that the Secretary mentioned, the early 80s, the mid 80s, and then the four-year drought. There was a four-year drought in 1999 to 2002 that decimated oysters through the state. Eastern Bay was pummeled. The harvest dropped to just thousands of bushels, where it was once 200-some thousand bushels. Uh, so Eastern Bay is a place that was once very productive, and we wondered maybe it still shows potential because the water quality looks very much the same and the salinity regime and the oyster bars are still there. So perhaps, and this is theoretical, perhaps if we put enough brood stock back into Eastern Bay, we could see an increase in spat set. So it's really, conceptually, it's like the other sanctuaries. Let's increase brood stock, try to generate a spat set. But the new aspect of Eastern Bay was, let's try to get everyone working together to move the ball forward. So the, the bottom line now is, uh, it's approved, there's a budget for it, uh, spat plantings have been occurring in Eastern Bay, and the commitment, as you see on the slide, is to plant spat and shell over a 25-year period, and this will be advanced, uh, you know, stepwise. So we'll, we'll get funding. We'll have to come back and show the results and get more funding, et cetera. So the idea is to have a long-term commitment and see if we can get Eastern Bay back to what it once had behind or, or what it once had. And uh, I think a, a way to summarize Eastern Bay is, again, being inclusive versus exclusive. We're attempting, if I can borrow a phrase, to leave no one behind. Uh, to, to include the three legs of the stool together, because if you work with oysters long enough, it can be very contentious, and it's better that we all work together to get the job done. So I am going to pass it over now to Jody. She knows a great deal more about the best management plan or best management practices on oysters and uh, uh, nutrient credits. Thank you. 
So recently, in the last couple of years, oysters were approved to be what we call BMPs, or best management practice, to remove nitrogen and phosphorus from the water column. It's currently approved in aquaculture practices, as, as Chris described, so what individual leases the bottom uh, from DNR and plants baby oysters there, shell, and then commercially harvest. It is also currently being studied to see if it can be considered a BMP in restoration practices as well as in um, public fishery practices. Recently, there was a journal article that came out in the um, Bay Journal, the newspaper, highlighting this uh, activity. So a bunch of harvesters got together and formed a Wacomico River Oyster Co-op, and that's in Charles County, Maryland. Um, they received a lease from the department. They planted oysters. In that article, the county administrator was actually quoted as saying, this is a win-win-win situation. And the three wins being, one, more oysters in the water, because they were planted there. There was harvest revenue from the harvesters themselves. And then also nitrogen and phosphorus were removed, and it helped the county because they were able to buy the credits to um, move towards their reduction goals in nitrogen and phosphorus. So I thought um, Mr. Belton's comment about win-win-win was a very interesting and um, good analysis of that project. Um, so this is something that in the future, like I said, if, the, if it gets approved for restoration, there may be some progress there or for the commercial fishery, but in terms of aquaculture, it's something that the department is looking into and trying to encourage. And that's the last slide. Um, before I open it up to questions, just a couple things, uh, Chris and Jody. Uh, describe to the committee what the natural predators for oysters are. Sure. Oysters have a few natural predators. Uh, when you're a small oyster, they're fairly numerous. Small mud crabs will eat a small spat and even a fairly larger spat. Uh, blue crabs will eat spat. Blue crabs can even eat what we call a small oyster. It's moved beyond one inch in size. It becomes a small and then it becomes a market oyster for the, for the industry. So uh, mud crabs, blue crabs, uh, another terrible uh, creature in the bay. Very few people have ever seen it. It's called a flatworm, stylocus. Uh, it's the, in fact, it's called the predatory flatworm. When a small spat oyster, so imagine it's half an inch to an inch in size, a small spat opens up to feed, there's a little gap because the shells are open. This predatory flatworm is about size of your thumbprint and it will slither into that opening and actually just start eating the oyster alive and predatory flatworms can decimate spat populations at a hatchery can decimate populations at an oyster farm if they have small spat and in nature so they won't kill all the oysters but surprisingly something as innocuous as a worm can do a lot of damage uh, when you become a small oyster, say two, two and a half inches, there's not a lot that's going to hurt you. Uh, in Virginia, where it's a lot saltier, they have cow-nosed rays. Now, we have cow-nosed rays, and I've only seen a few instances of them literally crunching the shells of the smalls and eating them, but it's fairly prevalent in Virginia. Uh, and now going back from, say, a cow-nosed ray size, which is large, to now microscopic, a, a real problem with oysters, but fortunately not recently, are the two diseases, MSX and Dermo. Uh, you can be a large oyster and die from disease. You can be a spat and die from disease. So diseases are just a, a, a huge impact on the population. Now here's some good news. We haven't had disease mortalities, say a disease issue, for at least 15 years. We have MSX in Maryland. We have dermo in Maryland. The levels fluctuate, so we have disease present, but it takes a fairly significant drought, a dry period, for the salinity spikes to aggravate these diseases where they cause a problem. So, so the good news is we really don't have much disease mortality over the last 15 years, and that's terrific. But the diseases are present. They still can wreak havoc. So I mentioned the four-year drought of 1999 to 2002 decimated many areas uh, and put us in the bind that we're trying to, to come out of. 
if we have another severe drought, you really do want to watch the papers and the news and maybe have us back. Uh, those two diseases, invisible, microscopic, can wreak havoc uh, to the oyster population. So the disease is like the salinity. Yes. yes. Yeah, so I, I point this out to the committee before I recognize uh, questions. The complexity of the bay is such that salinity is good for the oysters and it's also good for the diseases. So you can't just very simplistically say salinity good, lack of salinity bad. It's just very, I, I like to describe the Chesapeake Bay as the largest and most complicated uh, laboratory experiment on the planet. So Very, very astute. If, yep. you have, if you have a dry summer, which can help a spat set, then you start praying for a bit, a, not a tropical storm, but a, a system, because then the salinity will decline in the late summer, and it will help retard these diseases. Uh, that would be the best of all worlds. Okay. So with that, let me uh, take uh, the first question goes to Delegate Jacobs, your buddy on the, your buddy who <laughs> wanted to lease the bottom. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary and, and uh, Chris and Jody for presenting Oysters 101. And uh, it's always good when the committee gets a, a briefing on oysters and the state of the oysters in the bay. And we just, one of the things I wanted to mention and we just talked about it was the critical balance of the high salinity and then the freshwater, which freshwater probably is more damaging of, of the death in, in more recent years. But the high salinity that you talked about with the drought, which ratchets up the MSX and Dermo, I know there was some concerns early this summer with that, but I don't think that we had any drastic numbers from what I understand, but <clears throat> I think you touched on it, the importance of this critical balance that, that we need to have. And also early in your uh, presentation, you talked about, you know, the fresh water going into the bay and, and the fact that the, the, the hard surface needs to be clean. So I'm wondering, First of all, with with uh, I can't help but mention the Conwingo Dam and anything I do, but <laughs> um, you know we're not the reservoir is full. We're not trapping any sediment in there, and you know it's forty percent of the fresh water comes into the bay every day across the dam. So I'm wondering if if you can say with any certainty that that is causing any issues in uh, fouling up the cleanliness of the substrate, you know, so that larvae can attach, number one, but what, how, how much of an impact that is. Right. Well, I won't comment on the Conowingo Dam specifically because that's not my area. Well, let's talk but, about the yeah. Susquehanna River then. Well, yeah, all right, so, well I, I was going to take a different tack. Uh, sediment, silt. So silt in general could be coming down the Potomac. So I'll, I'll be a, uh, an all-inclusive silt commentator. Uh, could be coming down the chop tank that has pretty good flow, the upper Nanticoke, Susquehanna, obviously. Uh, so silt comes in from the land. Land management and land say, stewardship is crucial. Silt comes into the bay, and if you've seen aerial photographs and after a heavy storm, it's dramatic. And that silt moves through the bay. Uh, it does a couple of things. Uh, I'll just comment on oysters. The silt eventually, it's very, very small, it's in suspension, but it is silt, it's dirt basically at a very small size. It will eventually settle to the bottom. Gravity takes it to the bottom. And uh, so your question about what can hurt an oyster, well, let's expand that. What can hurt oyster habitat? That's what I get from your question. Silt is very damaging. Uh, so it comes in from different sources, settles to the bottom. The bottom of the bay is very silty. Put a camera down there, take a look, you'll just see silt all over. So oysters need clean, firm habitat. And so much of the oyster habitat, the natural shell bottom, etc., cetera, uh, is silty. And it could be just a thin layer of silt. You know, you take a picture, you may not really see the silt. Or the silt could be fairly thick, and you see uh, basically like a mud icing on the shells. And also, oyster bars can be covered with silt, such that the shells are now lost. They're under the silt. So uh, what I take from your question, forgetting the kind of wingo, the whatever, <laughs> Silt in general, coming in from the land, land that has been exposed, uh, is a problem. It, it hurts oyster habitat for certain. So that uh, oyster glaze 
I mean, that mud glaze would would be uh, would could could or would prevent the larvae from attaching to the substrate. Is that yeah, what you're oh, saying? Yeah, I'll give you a quick example. For many years, we have a, had a shell planting program, uh, collected a lot of data. So to summarize it, when we made fresh, brand new shell plantings, say in June, then we monitored them. Spat set occurs in the summer, if you remember the oyster biology. Uh, so brand new shells, clean, a spat set occurs compared to a nearby natural oyster bar. Natural oyster bar has shells with some silt on it and barnacles and other things that live there. So clean shells get easily a three-fold better spat set, sometimes four, five, six, even up to 30-fold better in an extreme case. So it's documented. Clean shells, clean habitat will get multiple-fold improvements in spat set compared to a silty nearby habitat. And one of the best ways to achieve that is work in the bottom, I would... I yeah, mean, if, you can, if, you can remove the silt, if you can remove the silt, of course, that will help the shells. Uh, the difficulty is uh, the bay is a silty environment. So suppose you can remove the silt in some fashion, as you said, it can reestablish. So what we do in oyster management, we plant new shells or we can clean shells at a strategic time of the year. You don't want to do that in the middle of the winter. There's plenty of time for the silt to come back. So the summertime is the time to focus on clean a bottom habitat for oyster spat set. So, you know, you can be strategic in the timing. Thank you. And one follow-up, follow uh, follow Mr. Chairman, the, uh, because we have the port here, I wanted to mention the importance of the funds that come from the dredging program that factor into this uh, combination of funds, so to speak, because the it's really, uh, the, wouldn't you agree that it's really important with this investment of, that goes back each year, these oyster committees make these decisions on, on what they want to do and, and, the, and the combination of all these funds, wouldn't you agree that that reinvestment and that, in, in that replenishment of the shell in various places in the bay are, are really what keeps this whole oyster habitat growing and, and uh, regenerating and, and being there for future generations? Yes, uh, the MDOT money, as we call it, is very important for the fishery side uh, to create the habitat, plant the habitat, plant the seed oysters, etc. On the sanctuary side, you're probably familiar, we have uh, ample funding from the capital budget. So whether it's the capital budget for sanctuaries, MDOT budget for the fishery, uh, basically back to the three-legged stool. And aquaculture, of course, is a private activity. Uh, ample and needed funding to keep that stool up and make progress is important. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I have to run to the governor's office, um, but obviously you still have the, the much smarter people here to answer all your questions. <laughs> okay, uh, understood, uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary. Uh, next question goes to Delegate Boyce. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for being here. Good to see you, Chris. Um, I wanted to follow up because uh, my good friend, Delegate Jacob, started it. Can you tell us in the, sub in the committee here about alternative substrate, I have not heard it mentioned, um, and it'd be a good lesson. Yeah. Sure. All right. Well, I'll introduce the topic, and if Jody has anything to add, uh, she's quite active on this as well. So, so back to substrate. Oyster shell is the natural substrate, substrate on the bottom. Oyster shell is what's been there for centuries and centuries, and oysters are used to, et cetera. And we, we prefer and we use oyster shell uh, any chance we, we can get. But they're all alter, our alternates. Uh, we don't have enough shell to provide for all the needs. So what else could be used? Uh, again, recycled concrete of a, an appropriate size, not, not huge slabs. Uh, something that would be conducive for an oyster bar or an oyster reef. Oh, there you go. Uh, reef balls. That, that's a reef ball. It's hard to see from here. Uh, reef <coughs> concrete can be shaped into reef balls, which are like igloos with holes in them. Uh, they've been used before. Uh, they can get a spat set, or you can put them in a hatchery tank and get a spat set and then put them in the bay. Uh, stones have been used. There's different types of stones, uh, different sizes, etc. So alternate materials can be used. Here's a few uh, ifs, ands, and buts about them. Uh, to put alternate materials on the bottom, they're not a natural substance for the oyster bar or the oyster reef, so we need permits. We have to get approvals, and we obviously have to keep them at a certain 
say thickness or level so there's not a huge obstruction to a sailboater or a waterman or, or whomever. Uh, so there's guidelines for using alternate materials and cost factors, et cetera. So that, that's the quick intro. And do you have anything to add? Um, that, his, that was his parting gift to me, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask a couple more questions, if, if I may, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to talk about the um, Bay Bottom Survey um, the last in 83, <clears throat> and would, when the new survey is done, will there be a comparison as it relates to not only shifts, but potentially um, the ability to see um, kind of the ebb and flow of, of uh, lack or more thereof of salinity? Um, you know, one of the things that I've been um, kind of uh, grasping with is, is kind of the idea of native, like things that we call native now, or not necessarily native now, but native to whatever uh, structures that are here now. So I'd be interested to know, um, would that map be able to kind of look at the salinity patterns over the pretty much almost century? The Bay Bottom Survey will focus on the basically the bottom structure, the bottom type. Sure. So it's not a water survey. Uh, the state has many programs okay. now to monitor the water, to look at nutrients, salinity, temperature, etc. Uh, this survey is basically a sonar survey. A signal is yes. sent to the bottom, it echoes back. So it will indicate, say, the firmness or the hardness of the bottom. And it's actually quite accurate. Uh, and it can dif differentiate between, say, mud, mud with a little bit of sand, sand, you know, different gradations of bottom. So it's going to be a, a the, the physical quality of the bottom will be the, sure. The so, um, and, and well, to follow up with that, could you then make uh, predictions or guesses about um, whether they're storm events or runoff as it relates to how the oh. bottoms essentially yes. have changed? Um, sure. My good friend over here, Jay Jacobs, has talked about um, uh, silt. Um, you know, is there more silt in one place than the other place and where these things could have come from? Right, the bottom right. is now higher or, or lower, so on and so forth. I'm just trying to get an idea about what not only the, the bottom, but like what other aspects can be pulled from this type of survey. Sure, I'll give you a brief answer because really a, a geologist should answer that one. But so here's what we know. These surveys, because they distinguish mud from mud with a little bit of sand, mud with a little bit more sand, et cetera, all the way to shell or stone, they're very accurate. So if there's an area where silt has, say, flooded in from a local stream or sometimes in the bay, we've seen this from certain, we, we are conducting sonar surveys actually now uh, to do our projects, just to do a uh, mm -hmm. sidebar. When we do these five tributaries and other projects, we do sonar surveys and we get the maps and, and we use those maps. The Bay Bottom Survey is, well, let's do that comprehensively through the bay. We already do it for the projects. Right. So what we've seen in a couple instances, uh, these are the geologists that talk to me. They look at the signals and they can say, oh, here's an area of sand that moved across the bottom over perhaps, you know, months and weeks. Like sure. the, the Poplar Island project, when they put the big dike around it, et cetera, Poplar Island. They noted, the, a, uh, they call it a lens, a lens of sand had migrated. So these surveys can, can distinguish differences over time, yes. Okay. And they can detect silt or sand that has moved and covered what once was an oyster bar. Those, those changes will be noted. Awesome. And then uh, some of my final question is about um, oyster size. We know what is, quote, unquote, harvestable, I guess, from like a public fishery versus what is harvestable from um, um, aquaculture. And wondering at any time, will these sizes be the same or are they going to stay different? Question. Yeah. Well, I know it's a bit of a controversy, but I guess well, yeah, I like you, Here's what we know now, because we can't predict the future. Sure. And uh, we're not high enough to, to do that. That's, that's so uh, uh, currently, the public fishery has a three-inch size limit. That's three right. inches are great. Mm -hmm. And the reason you can't harvest less than three, back to uh, my first slide on the fishery, we're trying to protect the brood stock, the population. Right. So the reason we have the three-inch size and no harvesting in the summer is Oysters less than three inches are actually adults. They'll spawn. So a one and a half inch oyster probably becomes an adult. Uh, 
and then two, two and a quarter, two and a half. So these smaller oysters are spawning oysters. They're the broodstock as well as the bigger ones. So the, the three inch size is set to help protect those smaller sure. brood oysters. Now in aquaculture, because uh, back to our theoretical oyster farmer, uh, he owns the oysters. He leases the bottom from us, but he owns his own oysters. So you are allowed, is it two? Two, two and seven two and a half. half. Thank you. Yeah. She, she knows more of the details. Uh, two and a half inches is the legal half. size for aquaculture oysters. And you need documentation and such, so it's, you can prove that you didn't take them off a public oyster bar. But the bottom line is there are different size limits in aquaculture compared to the public fishery. Now, just. I mean, yes, I do know that. I'm asking okay. at, at any point, will it be the same? Three and oh, three. Oh, I, well, I doubt that it would ever be the same. Uh, again, that's just my assumption. Because it's advantageous for the aquaculture industry to have that smaller size allowed. Uh, one, they own the oysters. It's mm -hmm. not part of the public sure. resource. Uh, two, there is a market for smaller oysters. A lot of people prefer those smaller oysters. But again, to be conservative in the way we manage the public population of oysters, we don't want to go there. Uh, the three inch size was instituted in 1927. The person had to struggle and fight uh, because it, it was a, a major step forward to protecting the population and the broodstock in, in the public resource. So I don't ever foresee going to a smaller size for the public fish. Even if the aquaculture farmer in particular is growing oysters to help build up the public fisheries? Well, again, be because they own their own oysters, That's, that, that okay. tolerance is given. A two-and-a-half-inch oyster, you can harvest it, you can sell it. They're going to repopulate their farm. Sure. So there will always be oysters there doing the services that oysters do. Uh, so, so that... That's mm. provided. I don't. I just I, don't see us ever getting a lower size for the public fish. Well, yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, definitely. If you're saying it's a 1927 uh, statute, but just curious about the opposite way. Oh, the I aquaculture see. might just, get larger. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that I, would be I, on I, par. I three and three. Yeah, I, I don't two point seven five. Yeah. I, two point eight five. I don't know. I'm just. I'm just my opinion. I doubt that the aquaculture industry would uh, support I'm or sure appreciate they that, that move. And there's really no need for it, uh, you know, for reasons I explained. Uh, uh, I don't think there's a need to go to a larger size in the aquaculture industry. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for your time this afternoon. Um, given the success of the large-scale restoration, do you have any plans for expanding that to additional areas? We don't have any plans now. Uh, let me handle that one this way. We work with the Oyster Commission. They're our main advisor. And actually, this is one of the key topics to come up to the commission. Uh, if you remember, they were mandated to do their consensus process, which they did, and to submit the report, which they did. And now we're amending our oyster management plan. So the next step in the evolution of, of this oyster discussion is uh, what is the next step for sanctuaries, the public fishery, et cetera, et cetera. So that will definitely be a topic. Uh, don't have an answer, don't have a comment. Uh, that is the topic of the day. Uh, what about the next steps? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Next up, we move to uh, Vice Chair Kelly Stein. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks very much for your presentation. Very helpful. A um, couple questions. Uh, first, it's great to see that aquaculture has rebounded over the past past couple of years. I guess my question goes to new lease applications. Is as far as you know, is the agency keeping up to date with new lease applications for aquaculture sites? Okay, a brief comment on this. I didn't explain this in the slides. Uh, our division, the shellfish division, works with the fisher, the public fishery, and sanctuary. The other of the three components. Aquaculture is an entirely different division, and that division director isn't here today. So just as a brief comment, uh, they get approximately 40 applications per year. That was information in the slide. And they uh, are short staff. They are in the process of hiring and getting ample staff. So their goal, obviously, is to keep up with the uh, continual supply of new lease applicants. OK, so hopefully with at least with the new staff, then 
the, the goal certainly is to keep up to date with lease applications. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's the yeah. priority. Okay. My second question is, um, it was mentioned that oysters are being considered as a BMP for restoration. And my specific question is, does that include coastal resilience? Um, no, not that I'm aware. Right now it's just the denitrification that occurs by leaving those oysters there. The filter, um, they just released, like just yesterday afternoon at like 5 o'clock, they just released the draft report. I have yet to read it, um, so I can't say for certain, but we can get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, really appreciate you being here today. Uh, I've got a question in reference to the leases. The first question is, which of the two, the column lease versus the bottom lease, filters the water more efficiently? Don't think we know, but I'll provide a few thoughts. So oyster filtration is, of course, done by the oyster. Mm -hmm. So if you have an oyster on the bottom and it's filtering and you move it to the water column, mm -hmm. it's still the same animal. It still has the same, say, engineering, the gills. and the, So very likely it's probably extremely similar because it's the same creature, simply a little higher up. Okay. But where it gets a little bit, say, uncertain, and all this, of course, is opinion, uh, there's more current up in the water, say, than at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So potentially, maybe with more current, more could be filtered. But I'm back to my first point. What does the filtering is the oyster itself. Right, right. And if you can only, say, lift 50 pounds by, on each arm, if you give me 55 pounds, I can't lift it anymore. So uh, it's probably limited by the oyster. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the other question is relevant to, again, the column versus the, the column versus the bottom. Uh, given all of the situations and the problems with silt and other things, why are there more column leases? I'm sorry, why are there more bottom leases than column leases? It seems to me like it'd be the other way around. Understood. Uh, I know this through experience, uh, having worked with the aquaculture industry, but again, I just want to remind everybody there is an aquaculture division at DNR. Uh, but based on all that I've uh, seen over the years, bottom leases are easier. Watermen have, or whomever, has traditional gear, a boat, a dredge. You know, you're already geared up for it. Uh, so it's easier, less investment, less outlay of initial money. Got it. Uh, the oysters are on the bottom. Oysters have lived on the bottom for <coughs> eons. So everything is, is very highly functional, say. Uh, when you're involved with water column leasing, there's gear you have to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be fairly extensive systems to anchor it, et cetera. You might need new and different types of equipment. Uh, one thing that's for certain about water column gear, especially right up near the surface, uh, gear in the water column, if you've ever owned a boat and not painted the bottom of your boat, it gets heavily fouled. Or if you've seen a dock piling, it gets heavily fouled. So water column gear, not only is that initial outlay of expense there, uh, say logistics equipment you need, et cetera, it requires extensive cleaning. I've seen many aquaculture businesses where they spend just hours a day cleaning equipment with a power washer, and they have extra equipment because it all needs to be in the water, and they simply rotate this equipment, uh, dirty versus clean. Gotcha. And it's a constant upkeep issue, and you have to hire someone to do the work. So it's, it's I think, labor-intensive, more expensive, more initial investment, but people make money at it. So not, not to uh, put it in a bad light, it's just uh, uh, more work, more money, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I think our last question is Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll be brief then if, if I'm the last. Uh, thank you again for coming. To, I just have a quick question about, um, you know, the, the, the periodic uh, bottom surveys. You said the most recent one was like the 70s and 80s. The previous one, was that the previous one in the 19 oh, teens? Six, 12. Yeah. The 12, okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess my, my question is, um, you know, having waited 40 years and then, 60 some years before that is there any talk about trying to establish a, a periodic basis that you know we could do this in would it, would the the bay and and everything benefit from from some sort of uh rhythm for for how often these surveys are conducted sold to the man on my left <laughs> yes 
<laughs> yeah, well, jo not just Jody and myself. Uh, all of us at the office have, you know, we need a new bottom survey. Mm -hmm. And uh, on a regular basis would be a great idea. So that, that would be something to do. Uh, Appreciate it. it. It's enough of a job just to get this one off the ground, but sold. <laughs> Thank you. Or motion passed, or whatever you say here. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Just to the committee, um, DNR is uh, a very uh, uh, important and complex uh, uh, agency with a very uh, important and complex portfolio. There's more to it than oysters, uh, but it's the w one thing that we are most, uh, it, it's something that's at the top of our mind because of the historically low harvests uh, over the last century. So. Uh, since the last century. So thank you very much. I'm sure we'll be seeing you several times during this session in public bill hearings and in other kinds of briefings and such. So thanks so much to both of you. We appreciate you all. Okay. You. Let's turn now to the Department of Transportation. We have the new Acting Secretary, Paul Wiedefeld, uh, recently from WMATA. Uh, we've got also Bill Doyle, with uh, the Maryland Port and uh, Chrissy Neiser with MVA. And I will say uh, my joke about Paul Wiedefeld was always that really only two people could shut down Washington, D.C., Barack Obama and Paul Wiedefeld. And Paul is the guy who did it. Uh, we had some extremely unsafe conditions in the Washington metro system. And uh, I will tell you, Paul, when, when this happened, I was immediately contacted by the press, and I think they were intending to do the chairman criticizes a Paul Wiedefeld interview, and instead I said, no, I completely support what he's doing here. And then, of course, the videos came out, and it was even scarier than we thought. So um, uh, WMATA is one of the hardest jobs in the wash within a 500-mile radius, and uh, I personally, from my opinion, I think we're lucky to have you as the secretary. So uh, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for those comments, uh, and Vice Chair um, Stein and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, I am Paul Wiedefeld, Acting Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to discuss Maryland Port Administration and the Motor Vehicle Administration's uh, departmental bills. Uh, as, as was men mentioned, some of you may know me. I'm no stranger to Maryland, worked at the department, having served pre previously as the Director of Planning and Capital Programming for the department, as the Administrator of the Maryland Transit Administration, as the executive director for the Maryland Aviation Administration, and most recently as the general manager and CEO of WMATA. Uh, first, I just want to say how excited I am for this opportunity to lead the team at MDOT and for the confidence that Governor Moore and Lieutenant Governor Miller have, <coughs> have and their entire administration has placed in me. I look forward to digging into the issues and collaborating with you and the entire legislature to deliver on the vision that I share with the administration to provide a fair, equitable, and sustainable transportation system for all the Marylanders, for all benefit of all Marylanders. In my first few days as Acting Secretary, I have met with MDOT's leadership, and my message to the team has been about transforming the transportation network in our state <clears throat> by supporting larger, larger societal goals, by listening to all our customers, and bringing them along for the journey of the greater good. This means improving mobility, safety, accessibility for all the, all the users at the local, regional, and state levels. And we, and we can accomplish this by developing a comprehensive, integrated, and connected multimodal transportation network. We must evaluate the mission of the department and we must elevate the mission of the department in recognizing the decisions that we make have a real impact beyond how we move just people. We have a significant role in the development of vibrant neighborhoods and communities, which ultimately sustain the economic growth and success of the entire state. Finally, I, I really do want to emphasize my commitment to the partnering with the legislature and ensuring transparency in everything we do. And as I know that much of what MDOT does impacts your constituents and all citizens of Maryland. With that, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Bill Doyle, the Executive Director of Maryland Port Administration, for his presentation. And yeah, let me say, uh, uh, Bill, it's great to have you here. Uh, he's originally from Boston. He's wicked smart. Um, he, uh, he uh, one of the 
best um, field trips we had as a committee was going to the Port of Baltimore and the, to just to see these gigantic machines. It's like being a, a real-life set of transformers. It's uh, <laughs> fascinating, and uh, there is no truth to the rumor that he did the voiceover for the movie Ted. <laughs> Not true. Uh, so anyway, um, now that I've completely humiliated you, Bill, <laughs> you, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Bave, Vice Chair Steen, and committee members. Um, you're always invited to the port, the entire committee. Um, please take advantage of coming to the port. Uh, the machinery is just incredible. Uh, let the record reflect, I am William Doyle, Bill Doyle, Executive Director of the Maryland Port Administration, Port of Baltimore. Please note that I have a PowerPoint slide deck that is available. I'm not going to go through it today, but it's available for you. What I will speak about today is available uh, in, in PowerPoint. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to present the state of the port this afternoon as we continue to sustain and create new jobs, build sustainable infrastructure, while ensuring the port remains a steadfast steward of the environment and a leader in innovative initiatives. The Port of Baltimore remains a strong economic engine for Maryland, with over 139,000 jobs connected to port activity where Maryland's make good-paying, family-supporting wages 9.5% higher than the average wage in the state. The port continues to drive local and state business and tax revenues and provide $3.3 billion in personal income to Marylanders. We were not immune from supply chain challenges associated with the COVID pandemic. However, we fared better than most ports as our dedicated ILA international longshore workers took the pandemic with the utmost seriousness from the beginning. The union leadership and members wore masks, gloves, sanitized the equipment and machinery, and showed up to work every day. I thank the ILA union leadership and members for their hard work and dedication to the Port of Baltimore. That said, we acted as a relief valve for the rest of the country during COVID. Throughout the pandemic, we had 80 or more container ships diverted to the Port of Baltimore that could not otherwise get offloaded in other ports. We were the relief valve. We also had to deal with the semiconductor chip shortage. We are the largest importer and exporter of automobiles in the United States of America. So the chip shortage had an impact in Baltimore. When you look at the chips, what happened is the manufacturers stopped manufacturing vehicles. Dealerships closed down because the country closed down. But your manufacturers had contracts with the chip makers worldwide. They weren't ordering chips anymore. So what did the chip makers do? They flipped the switch. They started making home devices, office equipment, Xbox, all of your localized equipment that you would use for home offices that's where the chip manufacturers did. And they're all foreign. So you saw the Chips and Science Bill that came through Congress recently. Um, that will take hold um, so that we can rely on the chips for uh, manufacturing in the United States, both military and domestic use. We have continued a strong rebound from 2020 lows amid impacts to the international maritime shipping industry. Of note, imported forest products at MPA terminals had its best year since 2014, and roll-on, roll-off cargo had its best year since 2012. Forest product, that is your Amazon boxes, FedEx, and UPS, home delivery. That product comes into the Mid-Atlantic. We are the Mid-Atlantic up through Canada, the port that brings in all of that um, from Finland uh, product that makes the boxes that you do from your Amazon on your phone. Those are the boxes. Our cruise business is back and booming with 100 ships calls coming in in 2022. Our competitive drive to market brought in over 349,000 passengers embarking and debarking at the Port of Baltimore. We are excited to bring a new home port call. Norwegian Cruise Lines will begin this year. The port continues to be ranked first in the nation for automobiles, as I said, roll-on, roll-off equipment and imported gypsum. Now, roll-on, roll-off, that's a very important piece. 
The roll-on, roll-off cargo is your farm machinery. The Port of Baltimore is the largest importer and exporter of farm machinery uh, in the United States of America. You look at the train lines that come in from the Midwest, the railroad lines. All your manufactured from Case New Holland, Caterpillar, and John Deere goes through the Port of Baltimore, both export and import. What we also saw happen over the pandemic uh, on the container side is you saw your Japanese manufacturers of farm equipment, uh, Komatsu and Kubota, pull their equipment out of containers. And what we, what we like to say in Baltimore, if it has wheels and a stop button, put it on a railroad. And that's what they did. They put them on the railroad ships. In 2021, the public and private marine terminals of the port handled a combined 43.6 million tons of foreign cargo, our second best year on record. With a total value of $61.3 billion worth of cargo moving through the port, the port had its best year ever, putting us ninth in the nation in terms of cargo value. This new dollar value record blew past the previous record of $58.4 billion set in 2019. We'll have the final numbers for 2022 in the near future. Our all-time general cargo numbers for the state-owned facilities expect to be record-breaking tonnage once we get through. We'll get those numbers to you soon. The Port of Baltimore has added new services, container services. We welcome diverted ships, and we are working closely with our partner, Ports America Chesapeake, to accommodate current and future demands at Seagirt Marine Terminal. Ports America Chesapeake, they're our public-private partner for the container terminal um, under that 50-year concession. There are several projects currently in the works that will improve efficiency, increase capacity, and reduce turn times for our truckers, including four additional ultra-large, fully electric Neo Panamax container cranes, part of a $166 million investment by our private partner, Ports America Chesapeake. Among other major initiatives underway at Seagirt, we've taken delivery of 15 new hybrid rubber tire gantry cranes. Those are those cranes that move, with, move along the terminal and pick up the containers while they're in there. Those are you know, dual fuel, meaning they can run on you know, low sulfur diesel, but at the same time, they have a bus power for electricity, so they can run on electricity too. The completion of BERT-3 modernization, including dredging, we have a gate complex recon reconfiguration ongoing and terminal densification is on the way. We are also in the process, process of maximizing capacity at the container terminal by moving all the chassis. So the chassis are the, are the trailers that the containers stand on. So they sit on the uh, trailer, we call them the chassis. And container repair. So when a container gets damaged, it needs to get repaired. ILA does both work on those, the union. We're moving those across the street into uh, what's known as Creekside, and we're going to do the repairs there. That allows us to have revenue-producing container move in and out of the Port of Seagirt. Now, how it's free tunnel. After decades, the Maryland Port Administration broke ground on the long-awaited Howard Street Tunnel expansion project in November of 2021. This will allow the Port of Baltimore to double-stack containers into the Midwest. This is actually a project of national significance because it just doesn't help the Port of Baltimore get to the Ohio Valley, Chicago, Columbus, Detroit. It also opens up CSX's entire East Coast network. You can go from Maine to Baltimore, double stack. You can come from Florida to Baltimore, double stack. You cannot go through Baltimore because of the Howard Street Tunnel, double stack. You can't go from the Port of Baltimore west with double stack. That will all change in 2025. All right, CSX decided to split the project into 10 smaller packages for design and construction. This allows the packages to move into construction as the design is complete and permits are secured. and allows easier processing of invoices and reimbursements since some of the funding is only eligible to be used on certain packages. Additionally, it allows Maryland Port Administration to stipulate certain policy considerations, considerations for the five packages that are in Maryland. For instance, MPA has required CSX 
to encourage all contractors to meet the state of Maryland's 29% participation goal for minority business enterprise firms for the packages located in Maryland. So far, the contractors that CSX has hired for the Maryland projects have committed to meet the state's 29% MBE goal. Four of the 10 construction packages, all in Pennsylvania, are currently under construction. So you're not seeing construction here right now because what's going on is you've got the bridges. So there's 22 bridges between here and, and Philadelphia, all right? The ones in Pennsylvania are now being done by track lowering, all right? The remaining six packages, one package in Delaware, so there'll be two bridges in Delaware, track lowering, and five in Maryland, are expected to begin construction in calendar year 2023. CSX current construction schedule uh, has construction ongoing until the end of calendar year 2025. So we're at 2025 for the completion, um, you know, of the whole shooting match. Um, in 2023, MPA will begin, begin construction of the first three of its Dundalk Marine Terminal Resiliency and Flood Mitigation Improvements, with a total construction cost of $42 million for the first phase. These three improvements include a 2,300 linear foot box culvert with a pump for extreme rain events. Basically, the way it works right now is you've got a check valve system. The port floods, the water comes into a culvert, and the force of that water will open up the check valve and it will go into, you know, you know, basically the Chesapeake Bay. What's happening is you get sea level rise and you have things that are going on that you'll have pressure on the other side of the, of the check valve. So when the water's coming down, if, if the tide has come up or you had an, a, an influx, a surge, the valve's not going to open. So we're going to need a pump system so we can mechanize those valves to allow the, the runoff to go in. It'll also have 14 tidal gates and backflow preventers and a perimeter barrier, barrier to prevent storm surge from overtopping the berths. MPA and Ports America Chesapeake have delivered the Port of Baltimore's newest container line service, the Zim E-Commerce Baltimore Express. That's actually the name of the worldwide service. Zim E-Commerce Baltimore Express, ZXB. The Baltimore Express is a service from China and Southeast Asia to the East Coast and was named after Baltimore because of the port's strong and capable e-commerce abilities and supply chain network. We are the e-commerce. Right. We are the largest e-commerce market in the, on the eastern Gulf Coast for ships. We have secured a significant upgrade to the service that will be announced in coming weeks, which includes transloading and shipment through Jamaica, Port of Kingston, round the world service. We also secured a $15.68 million Chrissy grant through the Federal Railroad Administration. The project will modernize the Seagirt Marine Terminal's intermodal container transfer facility, where containers are loaded onto and off the trains in order to increase capacity and improve operations. Ports America Chesapeake is leading on this. Finally, on the environment side, the, MEP, the MPA continues to work hard to closely align its statutory mission to increase commerce through the ports in Maryland with stewardship of Maryland's natural resources and the health and well-being of the environment in our neighboring communities. As the largest creator of wetlands in the state of Maryland, the Maryland Port Administration remains committed to holding this title as our aquatic ecosystem restoration projects move forward. To date, the MPA has restored 970 acres of wetland and wildlife habitat. The MPA has efforts underway to create, restore, or improve an additional 4,290 acres by 2072. This includes 1,343 acres at Poplar Island by 2042, 800 acres at Hot Miller Island by 2035, three acres as mitigation associated with the expansion of the Cox Creek dredge material containment facility by 2025, and 2,144 acres at Mid-Bay by 2072. MPA's strategic approach to environmental restoration using dredged material is the foundation for the Mid-Chesapeake Bay Island Project. 
This project located in Dorchester County, near what remains the James Island and Barrel Island, is a crucial future placement site and is significant and integral to the port's 20-year DMMP strategy. Once Poplar Island reaches capacity in 2032, even though the construction is done, we are still pumping into Poplar Island, Mid-Bay will accommodate nearly 2 to 3 million cubic yards of sediment dredged annually from the Maryland-Chesapeake Bay approach channel segments, while also restoring 2,144 acres of remote island habitat. The first phase of construction at Barron Island will soon be underway. Pre-construction engineering and design are underway for James Island, with construction anticipated to start in 2025. Inflow at James Island is anticipated in 2030. So 2030, we're about done with Poplar Island. This is in the wings waiting. We'll be able to inflow into the James Island. For harbor dredge material, so that's the Francis Scott Key bridge, that area, all the way into the Inner Harbor. Um, MPA is investing in innovative reuse of dredge material as a key component to the long-term success and sustainability of the port. The MPA has provided a dredged material for daily landfill at Quarantine Road Landfill for restoration of Ridgely's Cove Park in Baltimore City and has plans to provide material for the shoreline restoration of Middle Branch in Baltimore City. We're able to take that material and put it in the city for the coastal restoration. So you take it from, you know, all the way from Masonville down around Cherry Hill, and then you're coming into Baltimore and you're in the Indiana Harbor, and then you head over to the Harbor East. That material that we have, that we dredge from the ocean floor, we're able to use that. And at Ridgely Cove, you get down there. You can see the walking paths and the, and the grass and the trees and all that stuff. So it's a really good resource that we use. Because landfill for construction now is pretty expensive. We have it right here. We can use it coming out of the, uh, coming out of the uh, bay. Um, MPA recently acquired a 130-acre property adjacent to Cox Creek, uh, dredge material containment facility. That's Tronox. Uh, this acquisition provides an extraordinary opportunity for further long-term capacity, recovery yes, through large-scale innovative reuse of material. It's another place where we can put dredge material, dry it out, and then use it for innovative and beneficial reuse. I got a lot more, but, you know, as I conclude, I want to reiterate that 2022 was a major year for the Port of Baltimore. The state of our port is strong, and we look forward to continuing to grow as an economic engine for Maryland. Thank you very much. I have more, and individually, I can go through Paul, all that good stuff, the secretary, but you guys get the gist. Anything yeah. you need from us, let me know. We'll help you out. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we're going to come up to the port. We, uh, uh, our visit to Poplar Island many, many years ago was fascinating for me and for the members of my committee and our staff. Uh, before I go to Chrissy Neiser, though, you and I, I mean, we, we tend to be technology geeks, you and I, <laughs> and uh, describe to the committee very briefly this new thing of where ships can turn off their diesel uh, oh. engines and, and describe that briefly. All right, so the, the, what's going to happen over the next 10 years is there's going to be a renaissance on how a ship runs, okay? A ship runs right now on marine gas oil, low sulfur diesel, okay? I don't know if that's ever going to go away, but there are basically a couple of components uh, that, that are being used to run a ship. LNG is a marine fuel, okay? Liquefied natural gas, methanol, and ammonia. Okay, so that's for the ship as it's running. Now, our partner, Willenius Wilhelmsen, okay, the, the Roro carrier, our biggest tenant in the port, they're actually retrofitting a ship to be sail, to have a sail. It's a metal sail, retractable, but we're going to see how that works. Okay, so that's, that's on the ocean. Now, in port, when you're in port, one of, the, one of the things that you look at is, all right, do you need to use your diesel engines while you're in port? And, you know, the jury's out on what you can do, but yes, you could take that ship, like they do on the West Coast, and plug it into the dock, okay, which goes into the grid, okay? So they're, they're reevaluating that on the West Coast, too. You know, you may stop the local um, air emissions from the stack. In, in Los Angeles, Long Beach, 
But where is that energy coming from that supplies the grid? Coal plant in Arizona? I don't know. So what you have here in Baltimore, what we're looking at is there are technologies there that you could have LNG as marine fuel. As a matter of fact, we have the largest railroad port. The next 100 ships that get built for railroads will be able to run on LNG as marine fuel. Okay? So where are they going to be able to fuel? The next one is, is called um, hydrogen fuel cell technology. Okay? Hydrogen fuel cell technology, um, what you would be able to do, and we'll see, we don't know yet, um, is you could, you could build a skid, basically a chassis, put the com components on the skid, and you could take that hydrogen fuel cell and move it from ship to ship, tow it from ship to ship, same thing. Plug in, create your electricity to run the ship, turning off the diesel engines. These are all things, these is all cutting edge um, things that we're onto right now, uh, and that we are talking to at a federal and state level to try and get the best air quality we can in the port while the ships are in. Right, and, and, and the reason I wanted you to go over this is that obviously one of our objectives is to reduce particulate emissions in the port of Baltimore, in the city of Baltimore, because obviously people who live in urban and suburban settings especially are inhaling all of this. And the extent to which we can use modern technologies and proper management to reduce that is a win-win for everybody. And uh, I was, that's why I just yeah. wanted to make sure you briefly told us all and, that. And, and as, you, and as I um, stated in my remarks, that the, um, you know, as we replace diesel equipment, cargo handling equipment, we're going more toward electricity yeah. and battery. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. We're going to go next to our friend Chrissy Neiser, who, uh, before she starts, I just want to say it's been a pleasure working with you over the last eight years, and you've been very, very responsive to me and the members of my committee and others throughout the legislature when it comes to constituent problems. And so with that, Chrissy, welcome back to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate those kind words, Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the committee. It's certainly my pleasure to be back in front of you. Again, for the record, my name is Chrissy Neiser, M.MBA Administrator and the Governor's Highway Safety Representative. I'm going to essentially brief you on our departmental bills, but I did want to provide at least a little bit of context for where we are as an organization, not only for the newer members, but because we've evolved so much as an organization at the MBA. I'm so proud of our employees. You can see that um, traditionally people think of MBA branch offices and what that experience is like. Um, our wait time fiscal year to date from July through December is 9.7 minutes. I was really excited to be able to brief the secretary last week. We had a 3.4 minute statewide average wait mm -hmm. time. But not only that, because you could stay statewide averages, right? I'm a data geek too, so they can be uh, <laughs> extrapolated and, and um, you know, you get to the median, but we also look at percentage of our customers who experience that. So last yesterday, for instance, 88% of our customers experienced 15 minutes or less wait time. So it's pretty incredible, and it's um, something that we're continually working on, making even better, but it's been made um, part not only because of our wonderful employees, who again, I can't say enough about, but also because of the support of the legislature with our new IT modernization system, which has made a huge difference, um, as well as our appointments only process, which um, again, can't say enough about in terms of how it manages the customer experience, it makes it really pleasurable for everyone involved. Also, traditionally, again, you think about coming to the MBA branch office, but 74% of our transactions are now actually done outside of that traditional customer agent, um, customer relationship. So again, it's about customer convenience and how can we continue to drive that. Also at the bottom, I just wanted to mention we've really increased this one-stop government center approach. I always say, you know, coming from the transportation world, customers don't care whether it's a state or county road. You guys know that, right? You get those questions all the time. Likewise, they don't care what agency provides the service, they just know they want the service. So you can see the partnerships we've developed over the last several years from EasyPass, Department of Natural Resources, you just heard. We now issue birth certificates thanks to legislature for authorizing us to do so. TSA and PreCheck, um, that's a, a benefit we can offer, as well as our veterans. We partner with them at several branch offices. So CDL, and in some ways, um, Executive Director Boyle's presentation was a great introduction into one of our departmental bills. Obviously, the focus on getting um, more drivers into the CDL world has been something that we've focused on, as well as the rest of the world, as the increased demand for goods being delivered. 
Um, and so some things that we've done just to make you aware is to allow that submission of the medical certificate, which is required at least every two years. They can now do that online. Don't have to come to a branch office to get that done. They also can now use, there's a TWIC background check, which is required for the port. Um, a lot of our drivers complained it was duplicative. They have to get a hazmat or hazardous material background check. Um, so we now allow the TWIC background check to be used for MBA purposes as well. Um, we also have really focused on how quickly somebody can get an appointment. So you probably remember post-COVID, it, it was difficult because we had a lot of demand and it was hard to get that capacity through. Really happy to say, as a result of a variety of efficiencies, um, we have that down to two days. And in fact, many of our branches, you can get a next day appointment for a commercial driver licensing test. So if somebody wants to come into the industry, we're really trying to reduce those barriers. We've also worked with our employers to increase the number of providers where they actually do the test right there. So many of your counties actually do their own CDL testing now. Our large employers, like the utility companies and, and entities like that, we've actually added nine additional employers within the last year who are now doing their own CDL testing. So obviously that also relieves pressure for folks who want to come to the MBA in order to get tested. So I say all this um, kind of as an introductory to our first departmental, um, which allows, uh, would allow CDL holders to use a federal medical certificate instead of doing the vision screening. As you know, if you're over 40, regardless CDL, non-CDL, um, you have to get that vision screening done um, every time you're up for renewal. Uh, our CDL holders, as I said, are required every two years or sometimes less, depending on if they have medical issues, to go through a full a medical check that does include, uh, frankly, a more robust vision test than even what we do at the MBA. And so um, one of our employees came up with this great idea uh, to use that medical certificate um, to allow that customer to be able to renew. It would fall within the two-year requirement that's already in statute for the vision screening. And again, it's really more robust. So you can see um, as we look at 23, uh, 2023 year, um, over 11,000 CDL holders could benefit, meaning they could do that transaction, again, alternatively, and not have to come to a branch office. Another piece of that legislation would be to change the time for the co commercial learner's permit. Again, these are folks who are starting the process to be a CDL driver. We would change it for six months to one year. So as we looked at the numbers, um, FMCSA had changed the requirement several years ago. It used to be six months at the federal level. Now they allow up to one year, although certainly states can stay at the six month period. Um, with the new requirement in place, um, entry-level driver training, you may have heard this from some of your constituents, which is a federal requirement, really felt like the additional time was important. And again, as we looked at the data, it looked like there were about um, 5,000 individuals that were either taking that test again or falling out of the process altogether. So it's hard to say whether the ones that fell out of the process altogether would complete it if they had the full year, but certainly those who had to take the test again Really not a good use of their time, and again, not a good use of branch resources. So that's our first um, departmental bill. Again, just a way to increase efficiency for our commercial driver's license holders. The second piece of legislation is um, surviving spouse transfer ownership. So the legislature had the wisdom several years ago to say that you know, if somebody um, has just lost a spouse, charging them that $100 title fee um, in order to put the title in their name only, um, it's not really the best policy. And so the way the legislation was drafted, it applies when the spouse is a co-owner. Unfortunately, what we found out uh, since implementation is that you know, people have all different arrangements with different vehicles, so maybe that other spouse wasn't there when it was purchased, and it's only in the one spouse's name. Can I interrupt you for just one second? Are sure. these bills being filed in the Senate or the Senate and the House? Where, where, where are they? Because So they haven't quite been dropped yet, but my understanding is they will start in the Senate this year. Uh, I would prefer for them to start in both places so that we could get public hearings rolling as quickly as possible. Okay, we'll follow up with the governor's legislative office okay. on that. Thank you. So essentially, it just gives parity. So in the situation where you only have one owner on the vehicle, spouse has passed away, they need to take care of that um, in order to either renew or do something with that vehicle, this would also uh, remove the title fee for those folks. So you can see the data here um, in terms of the 8,662 jointly owned vehicles retitled with no fee and then 5,100 vehicles owned by the deceased spouse. And in that case, they are currently paying the fee, but under our legislation would not have to pay it. 
So again, I like to think these are just common sense approaches. Every year we try to come with to some good government things that I think helps all of our constituents and just makes the process easier. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Uh, that's terrific. We're going to take entertain questions for all of you. And just to very briefly say that uh, um, Secretary Wiedefeld, before you walked in uh, this uh, off uh, into this uh, committee, uh, I got a blizzard of tough questions for you, which I, I've decided I'm not going to um, rake you over the coals, uh, but I, because, you know, um, you and I have had a very good working relationship in our, uh, in previous iterations. I will say before I start to uh, entertain questions that there are a lot of very thorny problems in your bailiwick. There is the Purple Line in Montgomery County, which is, which we are hearing ugly rumors uh, about uh, further delays in costs that are that are hitting it. There is the status of the VEEP program and the policy decisions that need to be made with respect to that. Of course, there's the I-27495 project that uh, is hanging over from the Hogan administration. Uh, there are big discussions that we always have with respect to the mark lines and some of the proposed uh, private uh, solutions like maglev, which we're going to have to, which I don't want to really get into the details about right now. Of course, uh, you have BWI Marshall Airport under your, uh, under your, um, in your portfolio, and there are questions with respect to virtually everything from the concessionaire to to uh, the what happened with respect to Southwest Airlines over the uh, over the uh, uh, holiday weekend and then uh, and last but not least of course the whole issue of the red line in Baltimore of transit in the city of Baltimore itself uh, these are you, you probably have the biggest and most complex agency uh, in our state right now, and so that's it. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to rake you over the coals on any of these things. I look forward to working with you and your people very, very closely because I think working together and working in a bipartisan manner also that we can solve a lot of these problems uh, without having to pass legislation, without having to uh, having all of that angst, and so. Uh, are there any questions for any of these uh, fine folks here before us? Delegate Otto has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Question. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Thanks, and uh, I, I look forward to working with you. The Port of Baltimore is very important. Uh, Administrator Neiser, you've done a fine job there. And uh, I'm one of those 1,800 commercial <laughs> drivers that have to renew before the 15th of February. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, highway user revenues is the only thing that I didn't hear the chairman say <laughs> or mention in his remarks. And, yes, uh, we and need that's to important talk about that to too. us in the rural areas and, uh, and well, I think across the state. So, and thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. You get out of here unscathed, the three of you. So uh, let me say it's, uh, you know, I look forward to a very close working relationship with all three of you. Uh, I do want to bring the committee to the Port of Baltimore. I think of it as the Port of Maryland, actually, yep. and, um, and Poplar Island. And so and maybe we can loop a Orioles game in with that, too, so that we can have some fun at the end of the day, too. So. I know how to motivate these turkeys, let me tell you. Uh, in any case, thank you so much. And um, I believe we're going to need at least a five-minute a five break uh, before we can gear up our system to go to public hearings. And so we will be recessed for, or adjourned, I don't know what the proper term for that is, for five minutes. Uh, be, be back as quickly as you can be. He may ask.